we start off in the morning, right? Sivotaani, we wash our hands, we give our little pointed stucco, we pull out our prayer book, we say our little morning blessings, and then, then we start. And we start with a declaration. Our prayer, the formal morning prayer, starts with a decor declaration that the Arizal put in the prayer book. And it starts with Hareini Mikabel Alai Mitzvat Asei Shel Biahafta Larecha Kamocha. I declare, I'm making a declaration. I take upon myself this positive command, Biahafta Larecha Kamocha, to love my fellow like I love myself. Whoa, that is a very big and bold statement. And it's so big and bold, we say it every day. And we say it before we turn to God to communicate with him. Like why in the beginning of prayer? Like isn't prayer about me talking to Hashem, my personal moment, you know, conversation with God, maybe things I need, things I want, maybe thanking God for things, right? There's all different types of prayers. What is with this like big declaration that we say every single day, right? And how, why in the beginning of prayer? Why not a meditative moment right after Modani? Or why not when someone's getting on my nerves? Do I like go into a corner and say this declaration? Like why here? Why this way? What's so fundamental about this? So in order to really, really understand um, and go deeper, we always have to go back to the text. So if you look at this mitzvah and you go back to the original text of like, where does this mitzvah even come in? Like, where do we see, you know, don't eat milk of meat. Okay, don't eat milk of meat. You know, don't kill, don't kill. Don't steal, don't steal. Very concrete, very clear. Interestingly enough, this mitzvah we find in Leviticus and it comes kind of as an end of a passage. It starts a passage, the, the, pa the sentence or the pasuk in the Torah, the Torah passage. So it says basically don't exact revenge. Like don't get revenge. And um, it is part one of it. And then don't hold a grudge. Okay, perfect. Don't hold a grudge. Don't have revenge against people. And then it says, and like, and, okay, like this and this. Oh, and by the way, this. And then it says, love your fellow like you love yourself. So first of all, what we would try and understand is like, why is this so important? Why is this so fundamental? Why is the Torah telling me something that's about a feeling? Okay, because really there's a lot of debate in the Talmud. There's a lot of discussion. Is this even a realistic demand? Okay, and how do I go about doing this? Don't kill, don't kill, don't steal, don't steal. Very concrete, very doable, very clear. But like, how do I love my fellow like I love myself? Like, what do I do this? And so I was always thinking about this. The word love is so interesting in the English language, right? Like, um, I love my bubby and I love ice cream and I love your dress, right? Or, oh my gosh, I'm in love or, oh, it's love at first sight. And love has been like, absolutely like the, you know, love conquers all and love is all we got and love is all there is. Like this word love means so many things to so many people in so many different ways. Like what is the Torah telling us here? And how do we reconcile the word love that we're used to hearing in different ways with this really fundamental principle. It's so fundamental that before I start communicating with Hashem, I start with this declaration. So the interesting thing is if we have to break down the root word of love, love actually means have, which means to give. Okay. And I tell you when I, when I do dating workshops for college students, I always say to them, you know, like, if you loved ice cream, you wouldn't eat ice cream. You would like leave it perfect temperature control. You dust it off. You make sure you check in on it. Make sure there's no frost. Right? You love yourself. You're eating the ice cream. Let's be honest. Like the love has all these weird connotations. And yet we know it's about giving. But what is the Torah asking of us? Why is this one of the 613 commands? Love my fellow like I love myself. I mentioned there's so much discussion and debate about this mitzvah back and forth. There's so many questions asked. The questions asked are, you know, if you see this mitzvah in and of itself, you know, there's a mitzvah to be, speak kindly. There's a mitzvah to give tzedakah. There's a mitzvah to be an upstander. There's a mitzvah to save someone's life. So all of those are very concrete and doable, but what's with this like abstract, feely, intangible, what does this mean? How do I do it? Usually mitzvah are like much more like concrete, who, what, when, where, how, and like this one just seems so big and so vast. 
and so kind of difficult. And really, Nachmanides says, Ramban says, it kind of seems impossible. Like imagine, you know, a situation or a hypothetical moral, you know, reality of like someone, um, you know, being in a, in a, in a lake and, and it's either they have to save their life or someone else, a total stranger is, is drowning. Like, can we really be expected to have that same level of love or self-preservation for someone else than us? And how do I do that? Like, what if I'm struggling to love myself? And, and what if I love myself, but I have my ego? And guess what? When someone hurts me, it's really hard to do, right? We have this old, you know, Jewish issue, right? I love, ask Jews, do they love Jews? We love all Jews. Of course, we love Jews. What about your neighbor? My neighbor is that guy. <laughs> you know, that guy, forget it. Oh, what about your brother? My brother, I don't talk to him, right? So we have this issue when it comes to this. We love everyone, but it's a lot harder to like people and it's a lot harder to do this in a practical way. So Maimonides, who really codified many mitzvot and in a very neat, you know, clear, concise way. And actually my children just took their first test tonight for this whole like Maimonides study bee. And there it's like, instead of a spelling bee, they're learning codifying of all the mitzvot and their sources and who they apply to them. It's great to see them so passionate about these mitzvot. And Maimonides really broke it down. And he said, let's discuss this in a practical way because there's so many mitzvot that spin off of this or that this, this is kind of the umbrella for many applications of this mitzvah. So Maimonides says, look, it's how you speak about someone, right? If you love yourself, does anyone like to be spoken about, whether on Facebook or in social media, or overhear someone talking about you in the other room, that's really uncomfortable. Well, then therefore, don't do that to others. See how you feel about it. And would you speak about someone, right? So on a very basic level, Maimonides also discusses how in a practical application, if you were guarding your you know, financial means, protect your, you know, your fellows, your fellow Jews, protect their means as well. Meaning if you're passing by and you're about, if you would see yourself getting a parking ticket, you would stop it. So if you pass and you see someone else, treat them like yourself. Stop, you know, help them, you know, whatever it is that you need to do, feel for them like you'd feel for yourself. We know, we know that there are practical applications but there's a fascinating story told in the Talmud, which many of you may know, it's so famous. And it's about this person who was going to research Judaism, a convert, wanted to understand more about Judaism. And he approached Shammai. And he said to Shammai, who was a sage at the time, there was Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, two kind of, not opposing, but two very different perspectives on all things, on many ideas in the, Talmud, in the Torah. And he approached Shammai and he said, can you tell me the Torah while I stand on the foot? standing on one foot. And Shammai said, the Torah, the entire Torah standing on one foot? Get out of here, like no way. So he approached hello. And probably one of the words in the sentences that we know it's turned into songs, slogans, hopefully it's a part of our psyche, at least somewhere, right? Is hello said, something that's hateful to you, don't do, don't do to your friend. And that's something, okay, now we're getting more tangible. But then Hillel said something else. He said, that's the foundation and the, now go learn. That's the fundamental principle in the Torah. Now go study. What was Hillel saying? How could it be that this mitzvah is equivalent to everything? This mitzvah is so fundamental. This mitzvah is so concrete. This is the foundation. How do we understand that, right? It's an emotion. I mean, ask yourself someone you may struggle to love. Sometimes they deserve not, right? It's hard. They may cause you difficulty. They may cause you pain. It may be a complicated relationship. It may be you've been hurt before. There's so many reasons that it's hard to love your fellow. Like you love yourself. That's a pretty, pretty big demand. So what's interesting, and, and I think this, this one is just, there's so much there to discuss. Throughout all of history, this fundamental idea, this kind of umbrella, this platform is like the launch pad for so many other mitzvot and so many other ways of seeing things and seeing people. 
And as you look at the great minds and the great scholars throughout Jew of Jewish thought, you actually find that so many of them really try to tackle this different, you know, and go deeper and understand it from a deeper level and dip, deeper layer. Like, it's great to understand that this is a fundamental principle, but like, it's still hard. And like, what do I do if I'm struggling with it? And like, well, what does that mean for me if I'm struggling with this mitzvah? Well, what about the rest of the mitzvah? Like, how do I, how do I reconcile the challenge with this mitzvah, especially when I don't agree or when things are conflicting and things are a struggle? How do I reconcile those two? Okay. So in the, in the, the Arizal was a very well-known Kabbalist, pretty famous, pretty well-known. And um, he, he did not have a long life, but he contributed in deep mystical ideas, tremendous insight and a tremendous Kabbalah and tremendous, you know, real layers of understanding. And he was the one who instituted that we say this passage in the beginning of prayer. And he brought an analogy, which I think is so concrete and tangible. He said that all of the Jewish people are like limbs in a body. If your finger is annoying you, you have a hangnail, you're not gonna cut it off because it's getting in, it's annoying. You don't like your toenails because it's an ingrown toenail. You're not gonna be like, that's it, I'm done with you. If we see our fellow Jew, like our finger or our heart or our brain or our limb, can we cut them off? Can we not take care of them? Would you tell your finger, well, you know what? It's your fault you got burned. I am not putting on a bandage on you. You're not getting any burn cream. Stop being careless. No, it's your finger. It's a part of you. And that's how we need to see the lens that we need to see our fellow Jew through that lens. They are a part of us, just like limbs of a body. And we are all one. We are all united and we are all one. What we have to understand moving forward and moving onward, which is really, really, really deep, and we really need to work on how we do this, is we need to understand, I deal with a lot of college students, and they're constantly turning to me because they're dating. And if anyone knows anything about the dating scene in 2020, it's kind of a mess. I'll just say it that way. I usually ask, I start my dating workshop, I think, okay guys, to find the dating scene in 2020 and the adjectives I'm not gonna repeat here. It's not comfortable, fun, or um, as glamorous as it looks like on social media or on Instagram or Snapchat or any other apps that everyone's displaying all their relationships with or on. And I, I always get this, like, how do I know that this guy, you know, is either worth my time or how do I know that this girl is someone I can, you know, possibly grow together with in a positive way beyond it just being, you know, this relationship in college. And I, I always go back to this piece of advice. When you look at how someone treats something you love, when you're passionate about it, because a lot of students say, oh, but we both like Chinese, so it's perfect. And we both like heavy metal and we both love outdoor hikes. I mean, it's obviously meant to be, right? And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. How does he treat the things that you don't both like? Or how does she respect the fact that you need to go spend time with your family, right? Meaning, how does someone treat that which you love? And I always say to students, don't look at how the guy or the girl is treating you when they want to be in a relationship with you. Look and see, dive deep. How do they treat that which is important to you? And that's another way of understanding this. You see to God, to Hashem, each and every one of his children, young and old, male, female, it doesn't matter what your profession is, what your hobby is, whether you, what generation you're born in, who you even voted for. Every single one is a part, a Jewish person is like, an only child born to God in his old age. And to each and every one of us, if I, have a, if I recognize my soul and my relationship with Hashem, with God, then I have to be able to see my fellow the same light. They're God's precious child. I say to students, I say, none of your scrap material. You have the ag students and the engineers and the architects and everyone has a place and each one you are precious to Hashem. And this is an idea 
that really boggles their mind because when it says love your fellow like it loves you, you love yourself, it's not semantics. And it's not a mistake that it's not saying who you should love, how you should love, when you should love. It's giving you a very clear mindset and lens to see people and things through. And we have to go beyond the labels. The labels are toxic, they're destructive, and they don't help us live that way. The founder of Chabad, the Alter Rebbe, dedicated a real large portion of his fundamental teaching, the Tanya. Perak Lamed Beis, which means lev, heart, to this idea. And one of the ways he presented it is so mind-boggling. If you see yourself as a body, there's me and I have a devil soul. Okay, so you, okay, maybe you have a soul, maybe you don't have a soul, I don't know. It's me, I'm a body with a soul. But when we reframe our thinking that we're all souls, we're all a part of Hashem, we're all precious, we're all here for a reason, we all have a place in this world, even when maybe there's someone who hurts us, there's a place, there's, there's a place in this world for them that we have to understand that we are all Yisrael Achim Hamish. We're brothers, we're one, we are one. We all have the same soul from the same source, from the same place, from the same God who created us, who loves us. And you know, if anyone has more than one child, have you ever watched your children fight? Really is not a comfortable thing, right? It's really, my kids know if they wanna get on my nerves, my pressure, my barometer of stress goes from zero to 100 when the kids are fighting. I mean, in seconds, because they're my children. I love them. They're part of me. Each and every one of us is loved and we're part of Hashem. We're part of a people. We're part of a family. We're part of one incredible group of people of a mishpacha that have been, you know, lived, the eternal people live for generation to generation through ups and downs. We're achim mamash. mamash. We are literally brothers. So when the Alter Rebbe was discussing the idea of loving your fellow Jew, now obviously we have to love, we have to be respectful and loving, to, we have to be caring of everyone. But the command here, love your fellow like you love yourself, we're talking Jews. And you know what? It's interesting because that could be an uncomfortable, like what, like, what does that make us? Do we have to not be nice to everyone? Thank God as Jews, we have this you know, in, inherent, ingrained, um, ideological, you know, like I would say value. And if you actually looked at last week's Torah portion, it discusses how Abraham goes to bat for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, they're, they're God's like destroying them. Abraham says, what, this is judgment? Like this is, this is fair and balanced. And uh, then God doesn't get mad at him because he created all the people in Sodom and Gomorrah too, right? And, and, and then you see Abraham negotiate. What if I find this many righteous? And Abraham personified, Abraham and Sarah personified this unconditional love this being there and providing for others. So it's deep within our psyche to care for everyone. But I think what the Torah is telling us to love our fellow Jew, it's not because we shouldn't love others. It's because I think the Torah knows us. You ever had a conversation with someone? Oh, that, I see this, that, that, they go to that temple? Oh, that's like not really a temple. Oh, that one, they're way too religious. That one, they're way, oh. They're such a heretic, a little bit more religious than me. They're fanatic, a little less religious than me. They're a heretic. Where I am, exactly where I am, that's the best place to be, right? We have this, we have this within our psyche. It's a funny thing. And so when the Torah is telling us, you know, love your fellow like yourself, love, your, love yourself. When you love your fellow Jew, it's saying, you got to take care of your brother. You got to take care of your sister. You got to take care of your mother. You got to take care of your father. You got to take care of the family. And we certainly know historically that we have had to band together and take care of each other in a very deep, deep way. Um, what's also fascinating is, so I wanna tell you a story. It was a few, many years ago, and we had this joint Tashlech service between Hillel Chabad and the other temple, local temple. And at the Tashlech service, a visiting professor from Israel, he looks at me, he says, you're the, let you, looks me up and down, you're the Chabad Rebbe huh? Yeah. So in a very robust Israeli style, he says to me, ha, huh, what's your training? I said, training? What do you mean? 
He said, what's your training? Like, uh, I said, oh, do you mean like, do I know how to make a good kugel? So he like suddenly steps back. He's like, what, wait, what do you mean? I said, my training is Ahava Israel. Love for your fellow Jew. That's my training. He said, so, so uh, your, your, your congregation, uh, the Chabadniks go to it? Oh, I said, oh yeah, the Chabadniks go to it. My husband, my, my sons, my, my children. My, yeah, yeah, the Chabadniks in town I definitely come to the Chabad house. Oh, so you're for the Orthodox, right? That's what it is. I said, Orthodox, um, it's College Station, Texas. Those of you who know, there's not a large Orthodox community. I think the Orthodox community exists with my husband, our six kids. So thank God the uh, statistics you know, go up. Thank God the triplets Orthodox community in College Station jumped up quickly. And there's a few students who keep Shabbat. So I said to him, yeah, there's a few students who have grown in their Judaism and now they're keeping Shabbat. So yeah, I guess the Orthodox students come to us as well. So he looks at me confused. He says, so who comes? So who else? Then he said something which I don't think I'll ever forget. He says, normal Jews? I said, normal Jews? Yeah, I don't know. They're Jews, they're family, they're mishpacha. And then I said to him, you know what? Why don't you come tonight? Come for Rosh Hashanah dinner. Why don't you see who's a Chabad? Seems like you have some misconceptions, just come. I actually, I don't think I've been told him he had misconceptions because it was very clear what his conceptions were. I said, why don't you come tonight? Make a long story short, he came Rosh Hashanah dinner and he stayed. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Simchat Torah, fascinating conversations and debates and back and forth. And before he left on Simchat Torah, he got up and he committed, instead of uh, auctioning off aliyot, which some synagogues do, we auctioned off with mitzvot. And he said, I want to take one on. And I said, really? And he got up and he got very emotional. He said, I'm leaving after Simchat Torah. But I realized that God sent me all the way to College Station, Texas, for me to learn what true Ahavat Yisrael and Jewish unity looks like. All the way from Israel. He had so many ideas and he came in and he saw Jews. No labels, all part of the Jewish people. All family, all one. I don't know which temples, which affiliations. We're family, we're mishpacha, we're, we're one part of one body. And when a one part of the body is struggling, we help it. We don't ostracize our, our finger, our toe, right? And in this perspective, this perspective and this mindset really, really comes from the fundamentals of Chabad philosophy, of that idea that we're achim amish, that we're brothers. And it comes from really the Rebbe's mindset, the inspiration behind all, you know, over a hundred countries with a Chabad house and over, you know, every single state in the, in the country has a Chabad house, right? Over 5,000 centers, uh, rabbis around and rabbis around the world. This mindset comes from there. Once an older woman passed by the Rebbe and the Rebbe would stand in line for hours to give people blessings and a dollar. And uh, it was a meeting of the soul. It was a powerful moment. And this old Rebbe, this old woman passes the Rebbe and the Rebbe himself is in his 90s and she, she couldn't contain herself. She said, Rebbe, how? How do you stand for hours meeting and greeting on your feet for hours meeting people? How do you get drained or exhausted? And the Rebbe looked and said, does one get tired from counting diamonds? Can we look at our fellow Jew as a diamond? Can we look at them with light and with potential? And beyond the definitions and the labels, beyond the, the things that separate us. When the Rebbe took over leadership in his first kind of mission statement, part of it woven into it was a story from each of the Chabad Rebbe's before the dynasty. And each one personified the level and extent they went to for Ahavat Yisrael for love for your fellow Jew. And in the Rebbe's years of leadership, he instituted many, many different mitzvah campaigns. So if you ever got accosted by a young Chabad boy or girl and said, hey, do you want candles or do you want toilet? This was the Rebbe's vision. Every Jew should be searched out with love and, and care and, and the chance to connect and do a mitzvah. And so this, um, one of the campaigns was a Jewish education, very concrete, teach kids Torah, teach them the alphabet, give them the ability to feel confident. 
the next one was mezuzah, go around, put a mezuzah on the door to fill in, kosher, all of these very practical, tangible, concrete ones. And then comes this one. In 1976, the Rebbe came out with Mifza Avat Yisrael, the Avat Yisrael campaign. And suddenly a lot of the Rebbe got a lot of feedback. What? This has been for thousands of years, one of the things we need to do, why here? Why now? Other mitzvah campaigns, very clear. Get a mezuzah, bring it to someone's door, help them hang it up. Give them, you know, a workshop on kosher food. Very doable. This Avat Yisrael, it's so fluffy and intangible. And the Rebbe made it very, very clear that it's the call of the hour. That it's the call of the hour. And not only is it the call of the hour, but it transcends. It transcends and lifts up everything else we do. Because if you can have a relationship, you want to relate deeper in a relationship with God, and you want to deepen a relationship with Torah, you have to deepen a relationship with your fellow Jew and work and reconcile. And I don't ever claim this is easy. I don't ever think this is fluffy. I think it's deep, hard, challenging work because there's some people that it's a toxic relationship. Can I love them and look beyond that toxicity? What if I have a hard time seeing the good in a situation or a person? What if I've been hurt? And all of these are very real. M most of us go through life with some of those challenges. And so here's where I wanna take it one step further. And I wanna tie this into something that's really, really practical. My mother used to say, she used to say a line, she said, don't treat your sister like family, treat them like a complete stranger. It's very easy to be polite and kind to someone you don't know. You ever notice like you're about to like lose it and someone suddenly walks in the house or the phone picks up, suddenly a sweet, calm, and polite voice, right? Right. My friend said to me, she was once, uh, she was once walking in the hallway and she stepped on Legos and she, oh, she knew it was her son. She started yelling, my son, the Legos, why? I told you, don't leave it. Everyone knows what it's like to step on Legos. It's a special, uh, special injury. And suddenly her, the son, the neighbor's child pops up and says, oh, it, sorry, it was me. I by mistake dropped them on my way. My hands are, oh no, sweetie, that's okay. <laughs> that's fine, right? We all know the people we are closest to, it's the hardest sometimes to give that love. And my mother's wisdom was love your sister like the neighbor. Right, so number one, how can we look at those closest to us? Can I get beyond hurt? And sometimes we need therapy and sometimes we need help and sometimes we need advice from a wise counselor or someone, we, a mentor that we look up to, to work through, to establish healthy parameters for relationships when it can be also toxic. It's not saying be a martyr and love someone when they're going to be toxic to you. I think establishing healthy parameters, I don't think that's a, you know part of the myth. I think we would certainly be instructed on how to navigate that in a, in a healthy way. And I've certainly walked that walk with certain students who are coming you know, into life with toxic relationships and how to establish parameters where there's respect and um, you, know, not, you, you don't have to hate someone, right? And then the other thing I would say is try to see if we can develop an eye in tov. Can we develop a good eye? Can we develop an eye where we look at a situation or we look at a person, we look at a frailty, we look at an issue and we see beyond it. We see not what the person's flaw or issue is, but we see where it's coming from. This one of the, you know, you wanna talk about silver linings. One of the silver linings of uh, Corona time when Shabbat mornings, we weren't waking up and running to Chabad. My husband and I started learning more together. And I, I don't think I'll ever forget this. Very many of the things we learned, but one was from the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad philosophy that I said, who said, gotta love your fellow like they're literally your brother. They are on a soul level, they're yours, they're part of you. And um, he said that often we look at others and we see a flaw and we call that a chisaron, it's a flaw. But he said, you gotta go to the word. Chaser means something's missing. That means this person's flaw is a manifestation of something that's missing. It's an unmet need. Can we look at someone with an, a, a fresh eye, with an eye and toe, with a good eye? Can we try to look beyond the behavior? And can we love them like we love ourselves? I could say yesterday I snapped at my child because I'm overtired and I had a bad day. 
I can relieve myself. I can understand myself. I can justify a behavior. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it if he didn't A, B, C, or X, Y, and Z. Can I do that for someone else? Can I look beneath the surface and see the unifying factors, not those that divide us? It's deep work. Anyone want to share practical ways of how we can make that work real, how we can make that work practical, how we can make that work something that come tonight or tomorrow we can do? So, so let's let's explain this idea because it's a great idea. Mashpia is someone who's a mentor, and actually, it is it comes from ethics of our fathers that we're supposed to acquire a mentor. It is, you know, you you want to talk about life coaching and therapy and everything that's so in for thousands of years. Jews knew we needed guidance, objective opinion, perspective, someone who knows us, you know, knows our triggers, knows our flaws, knows our issues, and can help guide us objectively. And I love what you said. So it's a, it's a, it's something that not only is a, a really useful tip, it's something that also the Lubavitcher, we actually get, kind of begged us, he said, please get yourself a mentor, someone you could look up to, you could talk to, someone who's not judgmental, and someone's going to give you advice that's based on a healthy spiritual perspective, right? So, you know, in, in everything in life, we're always going to go to a coach. We're always going to go to something to get better at it. You know, business coaching, PR coaching, math coaching, I don't know, tutoring. We need this also for our minds and our perspective. And I love that. That's such a practical, practical way because I think what you said is real. It takes work and it takes sometimes stepping out of where we're at and getting an objective opinion. I, th I think our, our, our sometimes our, like, I mean, not sometimes, our ego blocks us, right? The sense of self kind of blocks us. And so we have to dial it back. This is the fundamental principle of Torah. This is, we say this, like the rest is commentary. We say this every morning. It's work. And we have to try to roll up our sleeves, dig deep. It's deep work because, you know, sometimes there are people who've harmed us and sometimes it's, it's hard and sometimes there needs to be just, and there's so many complex variables. And I would say if someone wants to know how to find a mentor, I think that a real practical way to do so is look around you. Who are people you look up to? Maybe there's a Rebbiton in your town. Maybe there's a friend who you respect their opinion and they have a certain level of clarity and a certain level of, of, of you know, perspective. And someone who's, you know, understands things differently. And that's who, how we can find that person. And I think that it works also on trying to reframe how we see things, which I think is deep work. It's not easy, but that was what Hillel was saying. It's at the beginning, right before that don't alarm, right when we're launching the prayer. And you know what? You know, when the Lubavitcher chose 10 Torah passages, to have all children know. They were fundamental ideas. This is one of them. Not, it's not cliche, it's real. It's real. And sometimes it means I need to look beyond the behavior, see what's really going on. You know, you ever had a kid roll in after a tough day and they're tantruming or they're cranky and you know what? Guess what you need to do? You need to really sometimes look beyond the behavior and say, what's going on here? Can we do that for others? It's work. And I have to say, this is not doing the subject justice. This is, we're scratching the surface because this is so fundamental. This is a platform. This is a launch pad for all mitzvot. There's so many mitzvot that are an outgrowth of this. But it's deep work that if everyone in the world took one step forward in this direction, we'll live in a different world. And we got to do it. That was my advice. I said, first of all, shut your social media. Step one. <laughs> Step two, look beneath the surface. Often you'll 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 see a big family feud happen. This one doesn't talk this one. When you ask what actually happened, oh, I don't know. The details of the fights don't always, they're not always relevant. And we know that actually they were the cause of both destructions of both temples, right? Both the temples were destroyed because of Sinatrina. Baseless hatred. So the way to counter that is is unconditional love, acts of goodness and kindness. You know, a reporter once came to the Rebbe and said, you know, what's your message for the world? And the Rebbe said, Act, random acts of goodness and kindness. Yesterday, I went to visit a student who unfortunately, her sister died pretty suddenly and it was pretty tragic or um, unexpected. And 
she told me something. She said that she was flying home from where the sister lived and they had just said goodbye to their sister. And the person sitting near her, first she gets on the plane and she's nervous about traveling. The person near her, you know, not everyone's looking and wants someone to sit near them, they want space. So she said to the guy, can I sit near you? And he said, sure. And he like moved things over and then he picked up her suitcase and they took down her suitcase and he waited for her. And she said, as I was getting off the, the plane, I just looked at him and I said, you have no idea what this act of kindness was for me. He has no clue what she's going through, what she just had, what occurred to her. So random kindness, random goodness, that's actually, I think, easier to train ourselves. I think it's harder when it's personal, when it's family. And maybe that's why it's telling us within our own family, we got to start doing that deep, heavy work. That because this is so fundamental, because this is a foundation of all mitzvot, the negative energy has got to really challenge us in this. But ever watch kids fight? You ever watch toddlers? I taught preschool for eight years. They fight. And they, you know, you know, you know, me know, I want it, you want it. They, they, they may hit each other. Five minutes later, they're playing happily. We can learn from children. We can learn from everything we see. My, my kids have this, they learned this year in school. They said, a man is a, a spiegel. A man is, a, a, a fellow human is a, is a mirror, right? If you look at something, you see something in someone else, there's a reason you see it. You may identify it. You may know it. You know, if something, something's bothering you, you're getting under your skin, there's a chance that you recognize that. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know what it was, what you were saying, right? So that's a really good way to look at it. The challenge for me was there's such a vast array of information to, to funnel it down to something more you know, concrete and tangible. But hopefully tonight, there's quite a few tangible takeaways. Um, and I hope there's some food for thought. I think so many of you shared incredible ideas and incredible, really practical and beautiful, inspiring ways of um, looking at this and really making this a practical. We want to keep these, you know, Mitzvah Mondays practical. So with that, we gotta, we gotta go forth in our, in our week and um, try to see things differently. One step at a time, one foot in front of the other.